Hi, I'm Miss Tyler, and welcome to Context for Kids. This is the back to school edition. Of course, that's only for my friends in the Northern Hemisphere. For you in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the middle of winter, and I'm sorry. Actually, you guys, you're getting close to spring now, aren't you? All my friends down in New Zealand and Australia. Anyway, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's really, really important to me that you guys know about Yeshua, Jesus, and his teachings. Now, if you've never tuned into Context for Kids before, I say Yeshua and I say Jesus. Why? Well, the person known as Jesus Christ, well, that's his traditional name in the English language. If you want to know how, you know, we got the name Jesus, I have another teaching on on that, but you know, he was born with the name Yeshua ben Joseph, Yeshua ben Yosef, actually. But different people call him th different things. You know, it in a lot of Africa, they call him Yesu, in some countries, they call him Isa. Um, in you know, in Spanish, they call him Jesus. So, you know, I go with the name that most people know and with the people that I teach normally, that's Yeshua, but I love the name Jesus, and so I'm going to use both. But just know, if I say Yeshua, I mean Jesus. If I say Jesus, I mean Yeshua. Same guy. Because the Bible was written about him, and it details his teaching, it chronicles his coming, death, burial, and resurrection, all that jazz. So anyway, we're going to be teaching about the Beatitudes. And Beatitudes are found in Matthew 5. Now, I'm going to keep these teachings to 15 minutes or less. And we're just going to do part 1, part 2, part 3, part 4, part 5 to make it easier for you guys. And I'm going to try and post a video every day this week. So without further ado, let's talk about the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And I subtitle this Messiah the Revolutionary, but he's not revolutionary for the reasons that a lot of people think. But he did turn the world upside down. I mean, we can all see it's different now than before he came. And I talked about that in my teaching, How Can We Prove That Messiah Has Come? All right. So the Beatitudes all start with the words, Blessed are. Okay. Stray here. Okay, they all start with blessed are. Now, Yeshua taught the Word of God in new ways without ever being unfaithful to it. You know, 1 John 3 4 says that transgression of the law is sin. And since we know that he was sinless, well, that means he never could have broken the law. What he did? A lot, well, not a lot, but sometimes was he broke the way certain people thought the laws should be kept. So he didn't hold to certain opinions, okay? But he's sinless because he never broke the law, right? I mean, obviously, if you break the law, you're a sinner. So he kept the law perfectly, and Paul says this all throughout his epistles, but he didn't always go along with the way people in the first century thought it should be kept. I mean, it's no different than today, right? I mean, everybody kind of says, well, what counts as murder and what doesn't count as murder? What's, what's a, a sinful lie and what kind of lie? It's like, can we like lie to the Nazis who are pounding on our doors looking for Jews? I think we'd all agree that, yeah, we can do that. But if you read the Cory Ten Boom's The Hiding Place, you'll see that there was a debate in her family, and they were all hiding Jews during the, uh, the Holocaust in Holland, whether they could lie or not. So believers throughout the ages have debated on, on how we keep God's laws. So it was no different in the first century. So like I said, Yeshua taught the word of God in new ways without ever being unfaithful to it. His ministry was all about teaching the spirit of God's laws, which was always about establishing God's justice and righteousness, teaching us how to love God and one another. All right? And what that's, that's Deuteronomy um, 4, can't remember, and Leviticus 19 and 18. Leviticus 19 and 18 is love your neighbor as yourself. 
And then for the life of me, I can't remember the verse in Deuteronomy that says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well, Jesus quoted from that. All right? The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were there to control our behavior on the outside so that we don't look like the nations of the world who were cruel and evil and had unjust laws. And they had different laws if you were rich or you were poor. For example, you know, in, um, in the law of Hammurabi, you see, there were different penalties for if you stole from a poor for a person, if you stole from a middle class person, or if you stole from a rich person. Let's just say that if you did anything to a rich person, you can kiss your butt goodbye. All right? Um, but if a rich person hurt a poor person, pff, slap on the wrist. Well, Rich people don't need to hurt poor people. <laughs> but that was the kind of laws they had in other nations. So, but God wanted people who would reflect his character, his values. I'm actually writing a book about this right now on, on being an image bearer and being part of the new creation brought on by Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection. So, I love this topic. It's so cool. So, blessed are, let's see, uh, like, I don't know what I did. <laughs> okay, so, what were the purpose of God's laws? Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. Keep them and do them. This is Moses talking to the Israelites right before his death. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely, this Nation, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? Whenever we call upon him, and what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? I can tell you firsthand, because I've read the law codes of the ancient world, they were messed up. I can't even... My latest book talked about some of those laws, but I won't talk about them here because they're just inappropriate. Anyway, so God's laws were there to create little image bearers. Remember that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, okay, in his likeness. Does that mean they looked exactly like him? Well, no, because Adam and Eve didn't even look like each other. I oh, hope. Nah. But, and, and God is spirit. We know from the Gospels that God is spirit. He has no form. And so they were created in the image of his character. Okay, they were supposed to reflect his righteousness and justice in the world and spread out and subdue and rule in righteousness and justice. And that is a big part of, um, of Yeshua's, Jesus' message. All right, we're going to talk about that. Okay, so blessed are, you know, I told you the Beatitudes all begin with blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Well, in Hebrew, they also, you know, in the Old Testament, we also have Beatitudes. Did you know that? Did you know Jesus didn't make up Beatitudes? They all start with the word ashray. Let's look at Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So this was a very well-known format, okay? And Jesus is going to use it with people who knew Psalm 1 like the back of their hands. You know, they all knew it. These, these, were, these were sung. These were, these were just well-known. And I should imagine the first one was probably more well-known than the others because isn't it always that way? So anyway, this was a beatitude. And ashray, which is translated into the Greek, in such and, and translated, it's translated into the Greek is another word that I can't remember right now. But then the Greek translates it as blessed. But ashray means favorable, um, honorable, that sort of thing. Okay, so when you hear blessed, think honored and favored. Okay? <sighs> but as Psalm 1, 
told people how to be faithful followers of God and the kinds of blessings that they would receive if they did this, if they didn't do what evil people told them to do, if they didn't kind of hover around sinners, and if they weren't comfortable around people who scoffed and mocked, then they were being good disciples of God, and they could expect certain blessings in life. Okay. Now, the Beatitudes. We're going to talk about this. Matthew 5. And we're just going to read them through really, really quickly before breaking. And then I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk about them one by one. So the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely, falsely, on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. So quick before we break here, let's talk about the audience. Now the audience, of course, was entirely Jewish. When Yeshua preached, he was preaching to a Jewish audience, and if it wasn't, it'll let you know. Sometimes he spoke to individuals who were not Jewish, um, like the Syrophoenician woman, um, the centurion um, with the sick servant, um, and the Samaritan woman. Samaritan woman, of course. But other than that, he was always talking to Jews who were obeying God's laws. Always. Always, 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 always. <laughs> I can't think of any other. There's probably one or two others, but, you know. Um, he was always talking to Jews, because he was a Jew, right? Okay. Now, the setting says that he sat down while everyone else probably stood. That's because Jesus was what they called a sage. You see, although it says rabbi in the Bible, you know, when they say rabbi, rabbi, well, the rabbis weren't really around yet. It's an anachronism. What they really were were sages or, or Rav. Rav was a little bit later too, I think, though. But Jesus is what we would have called a sage, a great Torah teacher. And there were many. And there were many of them walking around working miracles too. So Jesus wasn't the only one doing miracles. He was, however, the only one curing a blind man from birth and raising people from the dead who'd been dead for like four days. Yeah. <laughs> Unique. Um, now it says, and so what would happen was the great sage would sit down to teach and everyone else would stand around him. Well, that's why he was on a mountain in Galilee. See, it says he was Galilee. He was on a mountain. But, you know, I put mountain in, in quotation marks because if you've ever been to Israel, you know that what we call a mountain and what they call a mountain in Israel, there just ain't no comparison. You know, um, even Jerusalem is on, is on a mountain, but it wouldn't be considered a mountain here like in the U.S. It just wouldn't be. They would consider like hills, but that's okay. Because it's not the height, that's the location, location, location. Um, in Luke, it's called a level place. Now, a level place on a mountain, we think, well, no, mountains are pointy. Well, no, not all mountains are pointy. And actually, in ancient Israel, you would get places called threshing floors. And actually, the Temple Mount was built on the threshing floor of Ornon, the Jebusite. And that would be up high, up above a city. It would be flattened out. They would want it to be the highest point on the city because that is where they would thresh their wheat and they would crush it and they would throw it up in the air so that all the chaff, all the waste, all the debris would blow away. And if it wasn't the highest point in the city, then the wind could get blocked by one side <laughs> of, you know, of, of the mountain or whatever. You wouldn't want to do it in a, in a valley. 
So they would choose a high spot that was flat. They would have oxen drive over the wheat, thresh it. So, you know, when we see that he was on a mountain, on a level place, well, this is kind of temple language. Now, he wasn't in the temple because he was up north in Galilee. But that was the kind of image that it was supposed to project. Anyway, we're going to end here. And I will come back for part two in just a moment.